I just want to again remind us of why we're in this series, what the goal of this series is. And so as we look at these particular fruits, it's just a, 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 yeah, a caution or a reminder is to keep our eyes focused on the source of these fruit and the one who gives these fruit. It would be a, uh, a mistake, I think, if at the end of this series, we became a church all about the fruit. Does that make sense? Is if we were a church all about peace. Peace is awesome. It's great. It's needed. Our community needs it. Our family needs it. We need it. But I think that would be a misplace rather than keeping our eyes focused on the giver of these fruits. So I want to remind you of one text that speaks of this as well. And so if you'll maybe flip over your Bibles or just look at the screen for a moment, we're going to look at John 15 real quick which is just a reminder to us of the giver, the source of these fruits. In John chapter 15, it starts out by telling us that Jesus is the true vine. And so he's using this analogy that I think is really helpful to us. So there's three pieces to this analogy. There's the vine, the branches, and then the fruit. So imagine this um, uh, living um, plant that has a healthy vine, a life-giving vine. And off of this vine are healthy branches that are doing their job. And out of these branches are produced healthy fruit. And John 15 reminds us that the vine is God. He is the life giver. He is the one uh, who we must be rooted in. We receive our life from. And he, because he loves us, is granting us the privilege to be connected to him through Christ's work on the cross for us. We are, are in Christ. And because of that, we receive life and energy from God and are able to accomplish anything because of the source. And then the third part attached to these branches are fruit. And it's what God does in us and he uses us for his honor and glory. And so Galatians chapter 5 is giving us a little bit more insight into these fruit. Because John chapter 15 just tells us that you will, if you're attached to the vine, if you abide in the vine, you'll produce much fruit. And then Galatians 5 speaks to the fruit that will be produced. And so I just want to remind us one more time that we are a church all about God all about Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. We are about that. That's what we champion. That's what we sing about. That's who we praise. That's who we give glory to. That's who our eyes are focused on. And as we speak of fruit, let's remember the source, the life-giving um, one that produces these things. So I'd just like to read this for us just as a great reminder. John chapter 15 verses 4 and 5 says this, Remain in me. That's the command. That's the encouragement. Remain in me and I in you, just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine. Neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, the call, the reminder today is to remain in Christ. And so this time today, we are abiding this morning. As we open God's word, we're sitting just like Mary at the feet of Jesus, allowing him to teach us and remind us. And so I'd encourage you this week to remain in Christ, abide in Christ, spend time at the feet of Jesus. And what will the natural result be? You will produce much fruit. Two of those fruit we're going to speak on more today. So I'm going to invite my friend and my neighbor, Gary Heidorn, to the stage as we're going to kind of co-teach this text. And he'll teach us about two fruit, and then I'll come back up and we'll do some Q&A together. And so if you'd mind giving us some questions, we'd appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Gary Heidorn, and I am one of the elders here at First Family. 
And my wife, Kate, and I have been married for 30 years. We have two sons, one daughter-in-law, and two very precious granddaughters. And we co-lead a small group, and we are also involved in the nursery ministry. And the other ministry that I was involved in a month and a half ago before I had knee surgery was the snow removal team. And I, I think I can speak for the majority of us this morning when we say that we would be very happy if that team was not called into service the rest of this winter time. And for my day job, during the week, you can find me as a missionary in the accounting department at Farm Bureau. Now, this morning, we're going to look at the next two fruits of the Spirit, which are patience and kindness. And as I studied these, it became evident to me that they pretty much are, are different uh, in the way they present themselves. Patience seems to be more inactive, and kindness is active. Patience is waiting, and kindness is is doing. Now you see later on when we get uh, into to patience as well that it's not just sitting and doing absolutely nothing. There is an element of action to it as well, but for the most part, it's being patient and not having an action with it. Now, please don't raise your hands, but this morning when I came across the stage here a little slower, how many of you were thinking, well, okay, he... he could have started a little bit sooner there instead of waiting forever. You know, he, he's wasting time here. Now, guaranteed, if I was sitting where you are, I would have been thinking the exact same thing. But we grow impatient when we have to wait. We don't often look at the circumstances behind while we're ha why we are having to wait, and we become impatient. Now, some of our waiting can be improved with technology. Technology has really changed the way that we live our lives and how quickly we can get things done. And one of the pieces of technology that we purchased whenever I was in high school that was just a game changer was the microwave. Now, I know I'm dating myself by getting a microwave when we were in high school. But for us, it was a huge change because now with leftovers, you didn't have to put them in a pot and put them on the stove and heat them up and it takes five minutes and it's all dried out now and doesn't taste quite as good. So now you could just pop it in the microwave and 30 seconds later, voila, it's, it's great. And I'm not one who likes cold pizza. I know there are many who do, but I'm not one. So now then, 30 seconds, my pizza is nice and warm and I'm, I'm ready to have it again. Here's another one for me, and I, I know there will probably be some groans as we talk about this one, but I love instant mashed potatoes. All I have to do is take two cups of hot water, put it in the aforementioned microwave till it boils, pour the packet of instant mashed potatoes in the bowl, stir it up, and voila, I have my cheese-flavored mashed potatoes. And yes, I, I actually do prefer those over real mashed potatoes. I, I, I know, yeah, I, I knew that was coming, but <laughs> that's me. Now, why have these things been created? It's because we grow impatient. I looked up the definition of patience, and here is what I found. Patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Now, the opposite of patience is impatience, which is intolerance of or irritability with anything that impedes or delays. Now, with my job, I'm allowed to work from home two days a week. And but my responsibilities also require that I have to be in meetings once in a while. And some of these meetings uh, may just be audio, some are video. Now, in the video meetings, sometimes you have to have your camera on, sometimes you don't. 
When I'm working at home, my office, which is just a desk and chair, uh, is in the basement. So we've got couch and all these other things down there too. So when I'm in a meeting, I really don't want people to see what's behind me. So the software that we use at our company is called Teams. And a nice feature that it has in Teams is I can make a setting to where it blurs out the background. So when the camera is on, it's focused solely on me and you can't see anything else in the background. It's just, it's just kind of blurred out. When we get impatient, I think we turn on the blur feature. We're only focused about ourselves and we're not concerned about anything else that's around us. This morning, I'd like to look at an instance in the Old Testament where the children of Israel became impatient. And because of that, we're going to see the fallout that happened. In Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 to 18, we read, The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay there so that I may give you the stone tablets with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua and went up to the mountain of God. He told the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. Aaron and Hur are here with you. Whoever has a dispute should go to them. When Moses went up the mountain, the cloud covered it. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moses from the cloud. The appearance of the Lord's glory to the Israelites was a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Moses entered the cloud as he went up the mountain, and he remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Here we see that God called Moses up onto the mountain. He didn't tell him how long he was going to be there. He just simply said, come. And at this time was when God was going to give to Moses the law and the commandments. And we see on the, in the verse, last verse, on the seventh day, God called Moses to come up to the mountain, and then he was there 40 days. It also tells us that the Israelites saw the glory of the Lord as a consuming fire. Yeah, that must have been quite a sight to see that God's glory was just a consuming fire on the mountain. You, you would think it would be something that would just be seared in their minds and that they wouldn't forget what they had just seen. But it didn't. Dropping down to chapter 32, we see that the children of Israel grow impatient as they're waiting for Moses. Beginning in verse 1, it says, When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain... They gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. And Aaron replied, You wicked people, not forty days ago you saw the glory of the Lord on the mountaintop as Moses went to meet with God. Be patient and wait on the Lord. If only that's what Aaron had actually said. But he didn't. Instead, we see his response in verse 2 was, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he took the gold from them, fashioned it with an engraving tool, and made it into an image of a calf. There they said, Israel are your gods, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it and made an announcement. There will be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. Early the next morning, they arose, offered burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to party. In verse 7, the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people you brought up from the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. 
They have quickly turned from the way I commanded them. They have made for themselves an image of a calf. They have bound down to it, sacrificed to it, and said, Israel, these are your gods who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord also said to Moses, I have seen this people, and they are indeed a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone, so that my anger can burn against them, and I can destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Moses is out of sight for 40 days. And what happens? They take their focus off of God. They felt in their own minds what was a reasonable, reasonable amount of time for their leader to be gone. And they rebelled. They blurred in their minds what they had seen on the mountain 40 days ago. They had just seen the glory of God in a consuming fire. And they forgot about it. God had just told Moses in chapter 20, verse 23, to tell the Israelites, Do not make gods of silver to rival me. Do not make gods of gold for yourselves. And what did they do? They made an image of a golden calf. They grew impatient waiting on Moses and took things into their own hands. And what was God's response to Moses? He was ready to wipe them out. He had just brought them out of Egypt, out of being in slavery. They were wandering in the wilderness and they complained because they were without food. So God gave them manna. They complained because they were thirsty and God gave them water out of a rock. Now they're complaining because their leader is gone too long for what they thought. Aaron creates a golden calf. They bow down and worship it. And now God's had enough. He's ready to destroy them. We aren't going to read the rest of chapter 32, but I would encourage you to read the, in chapter, the chapter when you go home today. It, it has a lot of great information there. But in the remainder of the chapter, we see that Moses pleaded with God to not destroy them. He relented from destroying the Israelites totally. However, verse 35 tells us that the Lord inflicted a plague upon the people for what they had done with the calf. And also, 3,000 people died. Have you ever been impatient? I know I have been, and probably more often than I should. And one of my triggers is driving in traffic. I don't do good with people around me who are, are driving slow, don't use their turning signals. You know, I have a comment for that, you know, did that model not contain a, a turn signal or what? You know, things that I get impatient with. And just a couple of weeks ago, as Kate and I were going out to dinner, there were a couple of cars in, a, in front of us who were going slower than I thought they should have. And, and of course, I made some comment. Now, what made it kind of funny at the time was I knew I would be preaching on patience this Sunday. So uh, we, we kind of got a laugh out of it because of that. Um, but the thing is, at the time when it happened, and I knew I would be preaching this message, the Holy Spirit convicted me of it as well. Because I know it's one of those things that God is still working on me with. And the thing is, I have to continually stay close to God so that I can try to do better at being patient. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29 says, a patient person shows great understanding but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. That would be a, a great verse to commit to memory because I want to be someone who is considered to have great understanding rather than a fool. And how do I do that? I need to turn the blur feature off so that I'm focused not on myself, 
but on God and on others. Where are you lacking patience today? Are you a young person who is wanting to be married? You see everybody else around you getting married and you think, I'm never going to find somebody else. Are you getting to the point where you're going to compromise your standards just in order to be married? You know, two weeks ago, uh, Scott made a profound statement about his wife, Felicia. He said that she loved God more than she loved him. And to me, I think that is one of the best ways to have a godly marriage and a marriage that is going to last. If you love God more than you love your spouse, as Scott said, the overflow of that is even greater. So single young person, wait on the Lord. In God's time, he will bring you the perfect spouse that is the right one for you. Be patient. Are you dealing with a physical or mental illness and you feel like God isn't listening? God, do you not know the pain that I'm going through? I've been praying for this for so long. Why am I not being healed? Wait on the Lord. You don't know what it is that you're going through that is going to draw you closer to God in the season that you're going through. Be patient. Are you frustrated that your teenager isn't following God? You think to yourselves, but we, we've raised them in church. We've given them a godly model to follow our entire lives. Why don't they love God the way that we love God? Wait on the Lord. You don't know what your child might be going through, that they are going to be able to have a impact for God to others that they meet in the future. But if they don't go through this, they're not gonna have that opportunity. It's not you who is going to be able to change your child. It's only by God that they're going to be able to be changed. Be patient. Earlier, we saw how the children of Israel couldn't wait 40 days for Moses to come back down off the mountain. They were impatient. Can you imagine praying for 40 years for your parent to accept Christ as their savior? Tom Gable can. You see, Tom was in his 20s when he accepted Christ as his savior. And he prayed for his father that he would accept Christ. The only thing is, Tom Sr. wanted nothing at all to do with Christ. As I said before, earlier on, patience isn't just sitting around doing nothing. During the, the next 40 years, Tom was praying for his dad. Now, the thing is, he had to watch what he said because if he said the wrong thing, he was going to turn his father away even more. But Tom was patient and persisted in prayer. Fortunately, after those 40 years, at the age of 84, Tom Sr. understood what it meant to be a sinner, to need a Savior, that Christ had died on the cross for his sins and he accepted the free gift of salvation. And on, De on December 19th, 2023, when Tom Sr. passed away, he entered into the presence of Jesus Christ, his Savior. Praise God for a son who was patient but kept praying that entire time he never gave up on God. And he came to see the fulfillment of those prayers as his dad accepted Christ. What a testimony of patience. Wait on the Lord. Those people who you are praying for right now to accept Christ, that they would understand what he did for us on the cross. 
be patient. We don't know what it is that they need to go through in order to have that close relationship with Christ. Be patient. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. If you're here today and you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, God is patient, but you're not guaranteed that you're going to live 86 years like Tom Sr. did. You don't know but what today might be your last day on earth. God has been patient so far. But I ask you, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, please see one of us afterwards and we would be more than happy to show you how you can know for sure that your home is in heaven. So you may be asking, well, Gary, how do I become more patient? I'm so glad you asked. The answer is in the verses that Travis gave us at the beginning. John 15, verses 4 and 5. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. You see, it all goes back to God. There is nothing that you can do in your own strength. You need to be attached to the vine. It's all about God. Be in his word every day. You need to pray. Bring your praise and petitions to God. You can do nothing without him. As I wrap up this part on patience, I have a favor to ask of you. First Family Church is a church of 800 plus people and growing. And a few weeks ago, I was convicted as uh, I watched the 1030 service exit. Kate and I typically attend the 830 service, just what we've done since we've been here. But the thing is, as I watch people file out from this service, I realized I didn't know a lot of the people in this service. And one of the things I want to do is I want to get to know the names of more of the people in our church. You see, as a shepherd of his sheep, you're not my sheep, you're God's sheep, but God has tasked us as pastors and elders to be responsible for his flock. The thing is, it's harder, to me, harder for me to be able to be responsible if I don't know you. So I'm trying to be a little more forward, but I would also ask you, if you don't know me just by name, come up and introduce yourself. I would love to get to know you. I had uh, uh, learned five new people's names after the first service. So, and for me, I, I can't say I cheat, but I use this thing. And I have a list in here that says FFC family. So some of your names are in here. Um, and, and I may have a description. Uh, one, a couple, it says it's a, the, the tall couple. I'm like, okay, yeah, I know who they are. Jason and Hannah, okay. <laughs> but that way I can remember. So if you would please do that, and please be patient with me. The second fruit of the Spirit we're going to talk to about today is kindness. Kindness is defined as a type of behavior marked by acts of generosity, consideration, rendering assistance, or concern for others without expecting praise or reward in return. In short, kindness is compassion in action. You know, you can think about doing something nice for someone, 
And you can think, oh, you know, I, I really need to, to go over and, and take a meal to this family. But unless you actually go and do that, you haven't done an act of kindness yet. You've only thought about doing it. Kindness requires action. And the other thing it says at the end of that definition is without expecting praise or reward in return. Now, how many times do you also do something and you're thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to do this because uh, that way God is going to see that and he's going to reward me for what I've done. Or the other thing, we may say, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this act of kindness, but then I go in and I tell all my friends that, hey, I went over here, did, we, we took a meal to this family. Well, okay, you're just doing giving yourself your own praise. You're, you're wanting people to say, oh, you're so great that you did that. That's not kindness. Because as it says in the end here, you're looking for reward or praise. Matthew 6, verses 3 and 4 say, but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, telling others about it, that's not doing it in secret. You've already received your reward with the praise from others. When you do your act of kindness, do it in secret so that God will be the one who rewards you. And that reward will be much greater than reward of anybody on earth can give to you. Look at what Proverbs tells us about kindness. In chapter 14, verse 21, it says, The one who despises his neighbor sins, but whoever shows kindness to the poor will be happy. This past Wednesday, we just celebrated Valentine's Day. And it's easy to be able to give gifts or to be kind to those that we love. But what about when it comes to being kind and giving to the poor? And maybe a better question should be, are we even aware of the poor that are around us? Do we have our blur feature on so much that we're only focused on ourselves that we don't see those people around us who are hurting? Do we need to take our blur feature off so that we can actually see the people who need us. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for the following passage, but listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them from one another just as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. You see, when you perform your acts of kindness, many times it's to those that we have no idea who they are. God isn't asking us to just stay in that circle of people that we know. You know, it's very easy to do that in our small groups. 
we see that someone has a need and, and, and we automatically take care of that. We've been able to do that in our small group and it's just been wonderful to be able to bless those people. But in this passage, it's talking about those who we serve, who we have no idea. And the thing is, when we're doing that to those people, we're, we are doing it unto Christ. He's the one who sees. Many of our service activities at First Family are organized through our small groups. And one of the opportunities this past fall was when he had a day of service and people signed up and went out to help three different organizations. And the thing is, the people who signed up more than likely did not know the people that they were serving. They didn't know if they would ever see them again. They weren't doing it because they were looking for praise. They were doing it as unto God. In Proverbs 14, 21, talks about being blessed and to be happy whenever you give, when you show kindness. And I think that's it. I would about guarantee that if you ask those people who went out that day how they felt when they were done, I don't care how much work it was, I'm sure there was happiness because they were able to help someone else who was in need. I would encourage you, if you're not in a small group, to get involved in a small group. To be with a group of people who are like-minded and who are willing to help one another, it's an amazing thing. We've been involved with it since we started here. And I talked to a young lady after um, the first service who said she wanted to get involved in one. Talked with another gentleman before the service started and just how amazing it is to have those people around us who we can help serve together with. Paul then tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Now talk about a tall order. What is the way in which we are to be kind and compassionate? It's as God forgave us. And how has God forgiven us? In Psalm chapter 103, verse 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We are to do the same. You say, but Gary, you don't know what this person has done to me. You're right. I don't. But God does. You say, oh, but you haven't been there during the tough times of my life. You're right. I haven't. But God has. And how do I become more patient and kind? My suggestion is to remember how much you have been forgiven and I have been forgiven. And how did God show his kindness towards us? He sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. I can't say that I would do the same thing. So that's it, we need to when we think of what others have done to us, we need to think of what Christ did for us. Patience and kindness. Wait on the Lord and take the focus off of yourselves. And our take home truth today is take action against impatience. Get nourishment from the vine. As our first verse in the passage on the fruit of the Spirit says, walk by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. If you want others to see the fruit in your life, get nourishment from the vine.
This time I'd like to ask Pastor Travis to join me. And as we've done the last couple of Sundays, we will have time of Q&A. And if I can't answer, Todd, Todd has said that he would, so we are all good. So, In all transparency, as Gary and I were prepping for today, we just, we were wrestling with some questions. So we've got patience and kindness and uh, what are those obstacles or hurdles? And so we actually came up with the first two that we're going to talk about because they're ones that we've not fully grasp or are are accomplished in our own lives. And so maybe these will be helpful as you wrestle through these topics. Um, And please write them down. We'd really encourage you to take these questions with you to your small group and allow your small group to wrestle with these. So here's the first question that we came up with, which I think is something interesting for you guys to wrestle with. Is patience always righteous? Can patience be an excuse for disobedience? When do we wait? And when do we act? And I'll, I'll own this one. This one's probably a question that I wrestle with because I'm very good at being patient, but it's not real patience. It's passivity. And um, I'll kind of maybe use that as an excuse sometimes. So I'll take a first shot at it and then you can fill in the, the blanks there. And so as you look at our text, um, Galatians chapter 5, uh, even John chapter 15, there are plenty of commands for us to do. So for sure, patience isn't passivity. It's not a lack of any action. You can see in Galatians 5, it tells us to walk by the Spirit or to be in step with the Spirit. John chapter 15 tells us to abide in Christ. And so there's lots of things to do. And so I think what patience is reminding us is there's almost two categories of, of, of things, of obedience. One is the things that we have been called to participate in, to obey in. Those would be like reading our Bibles, praying, sharing the gospel. Those are living holy lives, fighting temptation. Those are things that every single one of us know. These are what we've been called to do. But there's another category of things that are out of our control, that are under the sovereign hand of God. And I think those are the areas where patience leans in and tells us to trust and to wait. So I think it's understand the two categories and the categories you know that are, are commands or um, yeah, uh, actions that God has clearly stated through Scripture. Let's be active doing those. How would you answer that question, Gary? Right, and I think too, just as with the example um, earlier of uh, Tom Gable, even though his dad uh, didn't want to hear him preach the gospel to him, Tom was still praying. He still had others around him who were praying as well. It's not just sit back and, okay, yep, God will save him in his time. I'm not, I don't have to do anything. No, it, it's, it's active in that patience while you're still going through that. It, we're called to continue, as you said, Travis, called to continue doing those things that we're doing. Um, and, as we, and the example also, you take a spouse, you know, if a single person is looking for a spouse, be in the right places. And when you think too, just take our campus collective group. And I picked that group just because it's kids who are in college and, and entering that time where they might be uh, looking for a spouse. Be, in, be around a group of Christians. You want to find a Christian spouse? Be around Christians. Don't be going to the bar. So be, be where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing while you're being patient, waiting for God to do what he's going to do. Yeah, so maybe a good question to wrestle with is, are you being biblically patient? Or are you being lazy, using patience as an excuse? So maybe a better question to, to wrestle with. All right, this uh, last question that we came up with, and this has to do with more of the kindness aspect. And how do we show kindness to those whose lifestyle is blatantly opposed to God's design, will, uh, while not condoning their lifestyle. Again, this is something I think we, you and I have similar uh, personalities a little bit and we avoid conflict. We were talking about that a little bit. So I'll let you start off with this one. How do we show kindness while, that, while, while not condoning? And I think the thing with this, the, the biggest thing is Ephesians 4.15 says to speak the truth in love. And I think many times when we have a disagreement with people, we, we attack and they attack and it's just going back and forth and you're butting heads and nobody gets anywhere because we haven't come with love. And we know that a, a, a soft response turns away wrath. And that's what we need to do. 
If you are in a conversation with someone and your voices start getting higher, then you both start yelling and there's no conversation going on at all. But if you bring your voice down, show kindness and compassion with truth, and that's the main thing. We can't stray and get into the things that, as Travis said, aren't biblical. We still have to come back to the Bible. You're not going to change everybody, but speak the truth in love. I think the one area that the Lord's really worked on me in the last several years is I, to a fault, I avoid conflict. If it's going to create tension between me and you, a rift in our relationship, I'm just not going to talk about it. I'd rather just remain friends than ever share my opinion with you. And I think what the Lord has kind of reminded me is of this truth, is that kindness is truth telling. That if I love you, if I care about you, I'm going to tell you what is correct. It's, a, a, it's loving to give a warning, right? And I think that's, as Christians, what we, we do. We love those that don't know Christ, that are far from him, that are living lifestyles opposed to his will. And so it is loving to sh tell them the truth, that this is opposed to God's desire for their life. And so that's something that I think that God's been working on me on, that I'm trying to gain, gain more boldness. How I do that is important, but it's not unloving to be bold. And then wrestle with this question, what is the most loving thing you could do to someone, for someone? It's to share the good news of Jesus with them. And the word of God tells us that the gospel can be an offense to those who are perishing, but it's so loving to tell people you're a sinner <laughs> and the penalty for your sin and my sin is eternal separation from God. But God loved you so much. He sent his one and only son. And can that be offensive? It can be, but it's loving to share with them uh, the good news. And I want to be somebody who loves people enough to tell them about Jesus. And I think the thing we just have to be cautious of is putting certain sins in a category that's worse. Like, I can't believe you people, how you could do that, and, and removing myself from that category. Christ died for sinners, of who I am the chief, to remember that I am in desperate need of Jesus, a Savior. And so you need saving faith, and I need saving faith. That's my only hope in forgiveness. I think that's a good reminder as well. So just encourage you to maybe take those questions, dive deeper into those in uh, your small group time and um, enjoy those. If you did text any questions, we're looking forward to answer those on a podcast maybe this week. And so thank you for those. Both of us get nervous with live Q&A. So we prepped the field for us a little bit there. But uh, can we show Gary our appreciation for opening God's word with us this morning? Awesome. Thanks so much, Gary.